So each one is that, the total is six square inches. Okay. If you'd like, what I could do is post this uh, whole thing. That would help you guys study to understand, go through this. So we'll go through it in detail today, and I'll post this on Blackboard. And then I'll also post uh, you know, sort of an example problem that you should be able to understand for the, for the exam, something like that. I can't really give you a homework right now because it'll take a week to do it. you have to let turn it in Monday, I think that's too soon. So, um, this is the uh, initial strain, no curvature. So if you look at this, this is the exact equation we wrote last time. We derived it, remember that? And what it's doing is it's taking the axial load, uh, that's B4, and dividing it by, let's see, B6 times F5. Uh, so B6 is the E of the concrete, it's the 4,000 KSI we assume. Uh, multiplied by F5, which is the area gross of the concrete, and then it's plus B5, which is the, uh, uh, let's see, we have B6 and F5, oh, okay, yeah, area of steel, so the first one is the E of the steel, and the area of the steel, the next one is the E, the area of the, e of the concrete, and So that gives us a 4.52 times 7 minus 5. That's the same value we calculated by hand last time, right? So that's the starting point. That's no curvature. So it's uh, just like this, right? And no slope. Um, so this is a slice depth. This is just uh, the width of the each slice. That's uh, the depth, which is B1, 24 inches, and divided by B3, which is uh, the number of slices. So that's this number. And then what I'm doing here is this is the uh, step. So uh, step one is just dead load only, no, no cur curvature as it says is zero. So when you look at this later tonight or tomorrow, you'll know what you're looking at. This is the iteration. So there's just one iteration. There, I don't need to iterate. I just back calculate the right roots from areas. It's linear elastic. Um, all of the strains are the same, right? The strain compatibility, there's no strain variation across the section. And so they're all set equal to this uh, value of 4.52 times 10 to the minus 5. I actually give it the equation of the strain O. So this first line here is strain O. See it says that there. Uh, the other ones are that. So here we have the 10 slices, 1 through 10 here. And then above that I have the Z position. The Z is this. So this is the first one, two, three, four, five, First position, Z is 1.2 inches, it's half the width, that's the centroid of that, and then 3.66 and so on, so it's 22.8. Okay. Um, so this is saying that the strain at any point is D9, if you look at the equation here, minus B9 times E7. And so uh, B9 is the curvature, which in this case is zero, so that's why it's not changing. If there was a curvature, you get different values if you go across. Multiplied by uh, E7, E7 is just the, the Z distance. So it's taking the strain at this point minus the whatever curvature we have times the distance to the centroid of that. Okay? So that's why it's giving you all the same results when you go across. Okay, now we go uh, to the next one. Oh, let's keep going across here. So you keep going, and you see stress is again, it becomes pretty clear if you look at it. There are 10 slices, so that's the 1 through 10. And all I'm doing here, um, these are the concrete slices I have after we go to the right further of the rebar as well. And they're a little bit different the way they're handled, so I sort of separated them. So these are the 
10 coffee slices. And if I look at this equation, these are stresses, I say if E9, so if E9 is the strain, if you go back across here, here's E9 uh, right here, the strain. And so I'm writing a general expression that works for me so that I can copy it down, right, for computer loading. If E9 is less than minus 0.00, Zero, one, three, one. That's the uh, uh, that number there was found. We derived that last time. That's the strain with cracks. And that's uh, in tension. Uh, we're doing ten here. Tension is negative. So if the strain is less than this value, uh, there's there's comma and then zero. So it, in other words, it's cracked. Give it zero strength. And then it says comma. And then it says if. E9, so E9 again is a strain, is greater than 0 0.001, then it's 4 KSI. So what that's saying is uh, if we're greater than this strain at this point, then just make it 4. This is 4 KSI. It's not the 4,000. That's just an E. It's not the same. This is the concrete strain. And then it says comma, which means otherwise. So if it's hasn't cracked, or if it hasn't gone uh, above its, uh, up to its plastic e, uh, strength capacity, its F prime C capacity, then it needs to be along this, defined by this modulus. So it says, otherwise, uh, B5 times E9, and that's, E9 is a strain, and B5 is the module plasticity, so otherwise it's a strain times B. So this is 0 0.001, right? And that's found, that strain, is just the intersection of uh, this and that. So this strain here, call it strain plastic, is uh, 4 divided by 4,000. OK, and this is the 4 KSI divided by E, and I give you that value. This value. This strain here, uh, call that strain cracking, and that's in, on the tension side, that's equal to so 7.5 squared of F prime C, this is the tensile cracking stress, and this is the modulus of elasticity, at least in and so you cancel the F square root of F times C's, and it's, it's just equal to uh, 7.5 over 57,000. That's where it comes from. 0 0.000131. Is that only if F prime C is in PSI, or does that work? Well, in, in this case, because the square root one's cancel, it doesn't matter, it's just a strain. It's in okay. Yeah, so it's just a strain. It doesn't matter if you're doesn't matter what the intersection, metric or what. That's why you're stuff like that. So that's this value here. So is that clear what this uh, this equation is doing then? So if the strain is less than and you have to say less than a negative, right? Because uh, if it's positive strain, it means it's actually somewhere over here. And you're looking at cracking. So if it's less than the negative this 0 0.7000131, then, then uh, set the stress equal to zero. 
Otherwise, if the strain is greater than 0 0.001 and greater than this, that's a positive, then set it, this is all four, right? Then it says set it equal to four. I hardwired the four in. I mean, if I did the F prime C diagram, you say it. And then it says comma, which means otherwise, B5 can be high. And that's just, otherwise, if between this point, anything else would be between that point and that, it's just the concrete uh, E modulus uh, multiplied by the strain. That's, that would be correct if you're here, or here, or here, or even here, or here, right? Okay, any questions on this before I move on to the next slide? Okay, so this is, um, where was I? This, is, this gives me the stress. And in this case, so that's the stress, and I copy this over. So let's look, as we go to the right, looks the same, right? The only thing that has to be locked is to see the B5 has dollar signs on it, which means uh, keep track of it, uh, it's, it's that modulus of elasticity. Okay, so it's the same equation. Now I go over here, and then these are forces. So it's exactly what we said, strains for the first 10 slices, and stresses on the same horizontal line. And I'm going over, I want everything on that and then after I have stresses, then I have calculate forces, and then we'll sum with that. Yeah, question. Yeah, the modulus is the same for um, compression and tension. Yeah. Okay. This is just for the concrete, right? This is still concrete. As we go further to the right on the spreadsheet, rebar shows up. We only have two lines of rebar. So <coughs> they might be too organized to do that. But the concrete, ten slices, I have to take a little more. So these are forces, and all this is is I'm multiplying. Uh, Stress, so that's P9, for example. If we go to the left, that'll be uh, right here. Okay. So P9 times F2. Um, and F2 is just the area of the slice. If we go back and look at it. Remember, we had one tenth of the total area was the area of the slice. Let's go back and look. Uh, F2, right here. It's 28.8 square inches. So it's taking that stress that we just found. Multiplying it um, by that. And then I go to the right, and each slice does the same thing um, because it's multiplying by its respective stress, which in this case is just the axial load with no curvature, they're all the same. And they're all compressive stresses. And these forces, see how they're positive? Those are all compressive forces. <coughs> I'm going to be consistent with the rebar using tension as negative and compression. So I'm looking at the concrete first. Yeah, you can do it the other way around, but at this point it would just be easier for you. So the stresses. Um, are all, uh, they're about 0.18 KSI, 0.181. They're all exactly the same. So the forces are all the same as you go across. They're all five kips, 5,000 something pounds, right? 5,210 pounds. So this says total concrete force. All I'm doing there is saying sum uh, this through this, right? AA9 colon AJ9. And that gives me 52 kips. Then I go over here. So now this is the rebar, and so uh, same kind of equation. I'm saying that the strain in the tension rebar and compression rebar uh, is just uh, D9. What's D9? It's strain O. So again, this is strain O. It's a strain here, but it's a strain here minus this slope, which is the curvature, which we define times the distance to the rebar. So you just whatever that distance in the rebar is. So if we go back here now. Um, so B9 is that curvature, which is zero in this case, it's AN7. And that AN7 is this, 21.5. So this first one is the tension rebar, so that's the rebar that's way over here somewhere, okay, on that side. So it has the strains over here, in this case, it's still, because there's no curvature, it's the same strain as in all the concrete elements, right? Because the curvature is zero. So it's just the strain L, which is the same. So that's that. This one here is the same expression, but it's multiplied. It's the strain L, and it minus the curvature, which is zero in this case, times AO7. And AO7 is uh, right here. And that's, so that's the compression rebar. That's the rebar that's over. Okay. Um, we go over. So these are the rebar.
power stresses, uh, this is the equation. So even though I know it's just a strain uh, multiplied by E in this case, um, I have all possibilities in this equation of rebar yielding tension or compression and going on to that second slope. So we'll look at this equation in a second. We looked at a concrete. Possibilities of rebar are this. Tension and compression are the same curve. Let's just put this straight line here. And so we're looking for this point. We have this E1, E2. This, this is doing is looking, uh, this is, as it says there, tension rebar, compression rebar. This one's the tension rebar, uh, rebar one and two. So this is the stress. If the strain, AM9, which is the strain, is greater than 0 0.00228, that's the yield. So that's this strain. say it was 66? Yeah, 66. So 0 0.00228 comes from uh, 66 KSI. 66 over 29,000. This is the 29,000 slope. So that gives me, that's why I'm Hardware, and then, it, like I said, you don't have to type in the point zero zero two two eight. You can do it outside. Uh, you can give the uh, yield strength of the material, and the model is going to have it calculated for you. And then hold that in outside just type this out. So if that's greater than this number, then uh, it's giving the stress. So it's sixty six plus two thirty. This slope here, two thirty k. This one's 29,000. This is very shallow compared to the 29,000. And we just remember we found that from this. So we just took uh, this stress, stress ultimate minus stress yield, divided by strain ultimate. If the strain is greater than this point, then we want to be, wherever we are, we want to come to this point. So that's what the equation is saying, right? And so if it's greater than that, then 66 plus, so then it's 66, this, plus the slope times this, wherever we are here, minus that strain. <coughs> so it's 66 plus 230 multiplied by the strain minus that point zero zero gives us the value of the stress for any given strain past that point. Are we, are we idealizing at all by saying that there's strain in the uh, compression rebar when there's no curvature at all? Um, there's strain, there's axial force. And so last time we derived uh, what the strain is across the whole section for axial load. Uh -huh. I mean, I just thought usually like the compression rebar has to be activated. So if the it, compression rebar feels the same strain as the tension rebar, it feels the same as all the other strain compatibility across the section. Okay. So under axial force, they, they all have strain. And if you actually uh, put strain gauges in um, compression reinforcement under just vertical load, you'll measure it's point zero 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 three seven five and then you multiply it by the area. Like the concrete. I mean, it's, it's the 
strain compatibility. So the surrounding concrete has the same strain as the rebar. It just picks up different stress. It's going to multiply by different modulus of elasticity of that. Okay. No, I was confused from, from concrete. But that wasn't an axial load. That was a, uh, that is You're talking about a bending moment, right? Bending. You're talking about doubly reinforced double concrete reinforced. section and yeah. tension and compression reinforcement. Um, yeah, I mean, in that case, uh, if it's just a beam with no curvature, there's uh, none of the cross section has any strain or stress. Yeah. Just yeah. the concrete. What's that? Just the concrete. If there's no moment, no axial load, nothing. Nothing has stress, right? And then you apply a moment. And Cracks and neutral axis shifts, and then the concrete, uh, the compression reinforcement you know, can, uh, it depends on where the neutral axis but can go into tension as well. Anyway, in this case, we have strains on all the sections, on all the elements, and they all have stress. Uh, what are we doing? We're looking at this, right? Uh, no. Yes. So if strain is greater than this, uh, then we go on to this equation. But then we have to, then it says comma, which means otherwise or else. <coughs> now we have to say that if the strain is less than the same value on the other side, this is minus 0.00228, so it's minus the yield strain. That means it's yielding actually this is uh, compression, and this is tension, the way we've modeled it, right? Because the concrete was positive compression, so uh, this is tension. But if the strain is less than this, then we have to say the same thing, but everything has to be in the negative direction. So if An is less than the negative value, so if the strain's out here somewhere, then we want to be on this slope. So then you say comma, but then you have to be careful, because it's not 66, it's minus 66. Right? This is minus 66. And we're yielding in the other direction. And then minus 230. And because I didn't want to get confused, I just said absolute value of the strain minus this, because I know it's in this direction. So it's the same form of the equation, but everything's negative versus everything positive. So that means if I get out here, um, so some strain out here is going to go correctly to this stress. So if I get out beyond this point, it's going to give me this. And then I say the final thing is otherwise, the last comma, uh, is just E times the strength. So then if, if it's not beyond this strain, and it's not below that strain, then it's just somewhere along here. It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, it's E times the strength. Is that clear? Yeah? How about the ultimate strain? How do you do that? That's, yeah. as you get beyond the ultimate strain, this point here is this point. Yeah. How do you see a contour here? What's that? How do you see a contour here? It's, it just continues, and if it in the analysis, when you get beyond this strain, then it fails. You're at that yeah. point. Yes. Okay. We just look at the results oh, you of the just strain. Look at the results. So okay. when the strain exceeds the strain capacity, then you reach your curvature capacity. And the strain, uh, uh, it, can, it can be the rebar. That reaches, in this case, would be if you're looking at this side, the tension capacity of the extreme tension rebar, the strain capacity, or the concrete. And then the concrete, we're following, I don't care about the crack side, I'm talking about the compression of the crack side. So here's the concrete, here's the cracking, and this is like this, and then that. You guys see that? So there was some strain capacity. I think I gave you a strain capacity for both. I said we have 0 0.01 here. We haven't talked, about, we will talk about it, but you calculate this directly, and we're going to talk about this, make sure you come on Monday, because we're going to talk about calculating what that strain capacity is. But for the, for the sake of teaching mobile curvature analysis, I just said, assume we know this, and this is 0.01, that's the limit of our concrete and compression. It's confined. If it's not a confined concrete, you have 0 0.003 or 0.004 standard ACI stuff. But when you confine concrete, you detail it for nonlinear behavior, the strains can be much higher than compression. This, it can go as far as it wants, I don't care. On the other side, when it's going that way, the tension side, it cracks, it's just opening up, now the rebar is activating. 
So the rebar we're worried about this strength at minus 0 0.15. So those are the two numbers we're looking for. If the rebar, to answer your question, if the rebar gets beyond 0.15, if the concrete gets beyond 0.01 in compression, the rebar in tension, um, then it's failed. And then that defines any of your curvature. Up until there, uh, it's a strain base. We're applying curvatures and watching the strains. And then determining what the moments are. OK, so that was for this one. And when I go to the, that's the tension rebar, the compression rebar, uh, it's the exact same equation, right? No difference. The only difference is that uh, let's see. Oh, it's just pulling off the strains uh, at a different position, that's all. So the strains, <coughs> so for the compression rebar, it's looking at AO9, that's this strain, the tension rebar is looking at uh, AN9, which is the strain here. Of course, they're the same. So the result is 1.3 KSI and 1.3 KSI for both of them. It's different, but the stresses are different than the concrete. The concrete had um, uh, 0.18 KSI. So for the same, uh, so it's a lot, much larger stress in the steel because the monoplasticity is high. It has the same strain. So multiplied by a higher heat, about 9 to 10 times. So you'd expect the stresses to be high. Let's look at the forces. So now for the rebar, the tension side, we have the stresses. The forces are similar to the uh, concrete forces, but that's arbitrary. We have 10 slices. We could have had 100 slices of concrete. And each slice would have a small as one tenth of the force that we're having now. Um, but for the sake of understanding, I only need 10 slices. Um, here we have uh, 3.9, about 4 kips in the tension and the compression. So we go sum up uh, total rebar force. I'm adding the two together. Oh, so this is just the rebar times the area. That's multiplied by three square inches. And this one's also the stress in the compression rebar multiplied by the three square inches. Now we go over here. This is the total rebar force. It's about eight kips. And then here, total force, I'm summing in the rebar force and the total concrete force, which is AL here, AL9 plus AW9. So it's 60 kips. And then here, the total applied force down is 60, right? So when we sum those together, uh, map this, the summation of forces, including the axial load and the resisting forces, should balance. So that means it should be zero. And we get exactly zero. Now, if we're iterating, it's not going to say exactly zero. But in this case, we were able to calculate the strain. So this shows for this first cycle, with no curvature, this works. All these equations, everything seems to work. So they calculated the strain. Derive that equation, that same equation is in here. Uh, and then from, we had the strain for all the elements, the 10 concrete elements and two rebar elements, tension and compression, multiplied by the different respective E's of the strains. And then uh, that gave us the stresses, multiplied the stresses by the respective areas. It gave us the forces, summed all the forces, compared it to the axial load, and it balances. So it's correct, right? All the forces from the cross section add up to the force down. And that's the only thing we're comparing, not moment. We calculate the moment. Uh, after the fact, right? In fact, we don't need to calculate the moment until we iterate. So here, so that's summation of forces. That's what we want to see, zero. Now I go over to moment, and it says zero, but that's not what the equation says. It's a long equation. And what I'm doing is I'm multiplying the force by the moment arm from the centroid So there are 10 of these, each one is at the centroid, not at the edge of the section, right? And then uh, I figured, well, I'll just take um, the force and multiply it by the distance like this. There's also a force from this rebar and this rebar. And because
because of the curvature, all of them are in compression, everything, the tension and the compression as well. Um, we calculated all these forces, but the moment is what we're talking about. Here's the moment. Uh, the moment is zero in this case by symmetry, right? And the equation, when I, it turns out it adds up to zero, which is a nice verification, because it's a long equation. And the reason it's long is there are 10, total of 12 elements I'm including. So this force here, multiply by this distance, right? plus this force and this distance, and so on. Plus this force and, and 12 of those terms. Um, and then you come over here, and it's plus this force times this distance. Um, this distance, let's see, um, this becomes a negative, this is a negative <laughs> distance, right? Because if, if you call all of these the same force and you did all the same distance, it would appear to be a moment. In reality, this and this count each other, there's no moment here, no total moment, right? And so these are negative distances. So that effectively, uh, no. And, uh, yeah, so effectively, you're getting this times this, plus this, times this, and so on, and then over here it's minus this times this, minus this times this, because the force is all in the same direction. But the negative uh, distance cancels the other one. Does that make sense? Okay. So when you go across here, um, so what I have is this is AA9. Let's see where AA9 is. It's the force in element one. That's actually uh, over here. That's this force here multiplied by B1 over 2 minus E7. And so B1, right, is the depth, that's the total depth of my section, divided by 2. So that's this minus that short distance to 1, right? So it's giving me this distance from uh, here to here. Like that. So to the edge of the section, that's the B1 over Twenty-four over two, which is twelve inches, and then it's uh, subtracting out this z distance here. So it's giving me this distance. So force times that. A A nine is a force. A B nine is a force for element two. It's again B one over two, so that's twelve inches minus uh, the z seven, uh, the z, the second z, third one, fourth one. Like I said, it's long. Um, keeps going. And then by writing it this way, eventually you get to negative numbers, right? So these are positive, and actually when you come over here, you're getting negative numbers. So the, the moments are properly added together. Uh, let's see what happens. And then the last two here are AT9 and AU9. AT is the rebar force uh, on the tension side, and U is the compression. And again, B1 over 2 minus the respective position. So I'm adding all of them together the way they're subtracting from each other just because it's negative or positive. When you can look at this, you'll, you can figure it out. But uh, it sums up to zero. And this is a good check uh, because when I first typed it in thinking it was correct, it, it wasn't zero, it was like 25, 15 or something. And I went back and found an error that I had in the equation. So uh, under zero curvature, it should be an absolute. There's no the this strain and horizontal across the picture. Why would there be a moment? The axial load's right here on the center of the intersection. So anyway. So now we understand the equations. So I don't have to go through all of them every time now. But now what I'm doing is this. So this is a step two. And this is the, the curvature. One times ten to the minus four. We agreed on that last time. What I did was I looked at the ultimate curvature approximately, remember? And then I said, okay, let's divide that by some number and then uh, round that off. So this is the first curvature, very small. If you're doing moment curvature, this would be uh, Going until 
somebody succeeded, some, some, somebody failed, and then that's the limit. So, and then this is iteration. So this is different than when we just applied the axial load. In that case, you know, we could solve the problem directly, and then we checked to sum up the forces, and it did balance, right? So it's exactly zero. Didn't require any iteration. In this case, we have a curvature. We don't know what that strain is at the edge of the section, so we're going to guess something, like we talked about before. So this is strain zero, where I am right there, the box is. And we see it's 4.53 times 10 to minus 5. It's the same as what was based on this axial load only. The difference is that the strain is very now, so you across the section, because of that slope. The slope is 1 times 10 to the minus 4. So each point, I have a different strain. Uh, because of that, now I copy the, st the stress equation down from what I've done above. And now you see you get uh, minus 0.299 KSI at element 1 here for this first curvature. But the second one says 0. That means that it cracked, right? There's no stress. So it went, oh, I don't have it anymore. Yeah. It went beyond that negative strain to a crack. And then we go to the third, all of the rest are cracks, right? And so the forces, other than the, it's the first one here, is not in compression, it's actually in tension, but it hasn't quite cracked. It's minus 8.6 kips. There's a tension, that element has a tension force of almost 9 kips. All the other ones are zero. So the total concrete force is minus 8.61. That's the tension force of 8.6 kips. And then when I look at the rebar, um, I calculate the strains based on that str assumed strain zero. That's not the correct strain now. This is where we have to do that midpoint method and iterate. Uh, that's the tension. This is the compression. We have uh, different values on the two sides, minus 2 times 10 to minus 3. Tension at minus 2 times 10 to minus That's the strain, so the stresses are minus 61 and minus 5.9, both in tension. So clearly everything's in tension, this is not going to add up to resisting the axial load of 60 kips, right? You need these in compression somewhere. So we sum the uh, forces together, we get total rebar is minus 200 kips, total force is minus 200, so you have to balance 60. We come over here, the applied force is 60, and so the the summation should be zero, and we have minus 207 kips. This is our first attempt. We didn't know we'd get. That's the moment associated with that, but that moment doesn't mean anything until we balance these horizontal lines here. That's balanced, and I don't draw another line until I get a small error. Okay? So the next one, <coughs> so all we know is this is not a converged solution. Now, this curvature. This is not the right, these are not the right strains, not the right stresses, not the right forces. The only reason we did all this was to sum, find the total force on the cross section, and it's, it's not zero, it doesn't sum up to zero. <coughs> so now we do something, we guess again, right? So that strain O of the dead load, or the vertical load, was our first guess. So this says, now I go down one, iteration two, second iteration. So you can imagine internally what a computer program is doing, and why it takes several. And now I'm putting a much bigger strain in, 0 0.001. See that? Arbitrarily. I'm just putting a number large enough so that when we go through this whole process horizontally, it sums up to a value on the other side of the summation force. Everything's a midpoint method after that. I need a positive number and a negative number of forces. And then I'll be able to iterate and, and zoom in. If I have forces only on one side, I won't be able to. So using this 0 0.001 now look. Uh, the reason I did that is this is a large um, compression strain. So I'm taking this whole thing and moving it way down here, knowing that I'll develop a lot of compression force, right? And therefore, I'll get on the other side. All the concrete will be, most of it will be in compression. And sure enough, when you look at it, now look, we have all these strains. Only over here are the negative uh, tension. So when I go to the stresses, again, copying this the equa same equation, we already developed the equation, so it's going to work for us. So the first one, look at that, 3.5 KSI, very large compressive stress. Second, that's uh, this element here. That would be over here. So large. So because we moved this down, it has a large compressive stress, 
stress, right? Large compressive strain, large compressive stress. The next one, uh, so this is 3.5 KSI. This is 2.5 KSI in compression. 1.6, and then you see minus 0.32. So that's tension, tensile uh, stress. And then look, zero is cracked. The rest of them will be cracked because they're half of the further up in this way, right? So once you find one cracked fiber, uh, the rest will be cracked. So we have all of this. So now the rebar, um, oh, these are the forces. So it's just multiplied by the respective areas. 100, 70, 46, 18, minus 9 kips, and then all zeros for this graph. So total force, that looks pretty promising, 230 kips, okay? Uh, rebar, we have uh, minus and plus, so the stresses are minus 33 KSI, uh, that's tension, and then 21 KSI uh, in compression. And that's pretty high, I don't expect them to be similar le levels, so that means this is not going to be balanced. Uh, we get the forces, minus 100 kips and 65 kips, and we sum them, and the total force is 196, include the applied force of 60, this should be zero, and then we have 130, but we got, we have what we want. So the first guess was minus 270 kips, this one was plus 135. I have one value on one side, one value on the other. Now we can use a midpoint method, right? I have a strain O for this and a strain O of this. The third one next, I'm gonna take the average of those two strain O's. So I'm gonna take this one and this one, I'm gonna take the average, and then this next one will be this. Here, right? That okay. is what we're doing. And depending on the force we get out, we're going to use those force results and uh, either after this one, either go here or here. And then we're going to keep doing that. And the, the slope's all the same, but we're iterating on this and looking at the force results. Is that clear? Okay. So um, now the, and a moment was calculated, but that moment doesn't mean anything because it's not a, a balanced solution. So uh, it's interesting to look at, but it only means something down here when we found the converged result. Okay, so we have this one and this one. Now I'm going to go to this one. Let's go over here and see what I did. Uh, so the curvature is still 1 times 10 to the minus 4, right? We're not changing that until we get a balanced solution. So I come over here. This is iteration 3, but now look. See? Average uh, of the two prior strains. 0.5 of D11 plus D10. So this is D11 right there, and D10 is that. So take the average of those two strains, that's what it's using. So it has this strain and this strain, I took the average and we're there. And now all the strains will be based on that same slope, but this minus the curvature times the distance. So you go across, this has all the strains. This is, everything's based on that. This is all the stresses. And so now you can see, uh, yeah, it cracks. Uh, yeah, it's less elements in compression, which makes sense because we went too far this way. Now we're in between. Keep going across, same process. Now go all the way across to the end. And now we have summation of forces. Again, the moment to the right is calculated correctly, but based on wrong forces. So we're not interested in the moment yet. So now we get minus 121. So we have minus 269, 135, minus, we're trying to make this zero, that's the goal. So now what am I gonna do? What am I gonna take the average of? It would be between this one and this one, right? Okay, so, and that will give me the fourth one. So let's look at, because this is positive and this is negative. So I'm gonna take the average of this strain and this strain out. So let's go over again and see if that's what I did. So it's still uh, step two that we're on. It's still one times 10 to the minus four is a curvature. Uh, the iteration is now four. And I'm taking, see the average, look at the equation up here, is one half or 0 0.5 times D12 plus D11. So I'm taking the average. So um, it's now the average between this one and this one, right? So now it's like this. This is the strain profile we're looking for. It won't always be like that. It depends. We have to look at the results and see where it falls. So 
So go over here, same thing, and it comes to the summation of forces. I have a negative, okay? So in this case, the last two are both negative. I don't want to take the average between those two because I'll never find the solution that way. At midpoint method, I always want to take the average between what's on one side and what's on the other side. So I'm going to take uh, the average of this one, where I am, and that one, okay, at 135. The strength, the average of the strength to this one. So you go back and you see that. Now this is iteration five, and you see it's 0.5 of D13 plus D11. So here's D13 and there's D11 up there. Is that clear what I'm doing? So let's zoom over, same equations. Let's do the same thing. It's, it's moving back and forth. More elements are cracking, less elements. They're not cracking in reality because we haven't found a complete solution. At the end, we'll know which one's cracking with all the stresses and all the forces. Um, so we come over here and we have 69. So now the next one, I won't go through every step, but you can imagine what I'm doing. I'm going to take the average between this one and this one, the same thing, and I get 31. And then I take the average of this one, not on that one, but that one and that one, and I get 12. So the error is getting smaller. And then finally, I get down to 0 0.4. So it sums close to 0, less than one kilo error. Um, if I was doing this, a Fortran program or another uh, program that's looping rather than this, I would get a, a tighter tolerance than that. And then I calculate the moment. Well, I calculate the moment each time. This, this is a approximately a converged solution. So this moment does have meaning. This is the moment associated with that um, curvature, one times the minus two. So we go over and look here. And that's why I put this horizontal line across the whole thing when you look at this. You know Still step two, curvature one times seven minus four. It took me ten iterations to get using the midpoint method. If I use Newton's method, it's faster, but sometimes you get lost, like we talked about before. So, uh, and then these are this is the strain at the edge of the section for this curvature, approximately you know, within the tolerance. And these are the strains of all the concrete fibers at the centroid. These are the stresses. You can see that it's cracked. Uh, the last uh, half of this. 5 through 10 are, are 0, so that's where it's cracked. These are all the forces. Uh, that's the total concrete force. These are the rebar strains and this first one and stresses. You can see, like we expected, there's much more stress in the um, tension rebar than the, so it's a 40, it's pretty high. It's almost to be able to minus 40, so that's a tension, KSI. And the rebar compression is at 15 KSI. These are the forces, and so on. Okay, so um, let's look at, and then that's the moment. So plotting the moment versus curvature, that's one point. We have the curvature, and we have the moment. That's all we have. We have zero, actually two points. Zero and zero, that's the first point. Zero curvature, zero moment. Now one times seven minus four um, curvature, uh, that is equal to this moment. Now, we go to the left, and I say, okay, step three. So, and I, it's two times 10 to the minus four, right? So I bumped it up by one increment. So this is the total curvature. This is my iteration one, first iteration. And I'm using the prior balance strain at the edge of the section as my first guess, okay? Later on, a higher curvature, that's a good guess. It doesn't have to change that much, but a low curvature is maybe not very good. So I go through the same process. I go all the way over here, and I look at the forces. Summation of forces minus 168 kips. That's not zero. And so the next one, I don't yet know what the other result is. So again, I just put um, same curvature, uh, same step, uh, iteration two. And I just put a uh, 0.002 instead of 0.001. Large strain that I know will get me on the other side of that force equation, a large compression strain. And they go over here, and I look at the summation of four total forces, and it's plus. So I have minus 160 and plus 230. And then I use the same process. So I, I take the average of these two strain nodes, and I get a 32. And uh, then I take the average of this one and that one, minus, and then that, and that gives me minus 84 so on. Uh, you can click through this 
spreadsheet and see what I did, and you'll see how the midpoint method works. At the end, I'm 0.05, so that nicely converged. And then I have a lump. So I have this curvature, 2 times 10 to the minus 4, and I have a moment of uh, 4,000. So I have three data points, the 0, the 1 times 10 to the minus 4 curvature moment, associated moment, and 2 times 10 to the minus 4 curvature moment. So here what you're seeing is the process of um, iterating and finally getting the right force balance, and then that represents the converged solution. So then, then you calculate So that was all I did on this. Oh, I plotted something for you. Okay, there we go. Okay, that's all. That's all I have so far. Two points. So this is the moment versus the curvature, and you want you know, maybe 100 points when you only have two. But then what I did is I copied over what we're doing here, and I let uh, Excel do a little bit of work for me. So the equations look the same. The setup is the same. I copied stuff over both. Rather than iterating myself the way. I wanted to demonstrate the iteration process to you. I'm letting here Excel iterate for me. You know? So each horizontal line on the sheet number two, not sheet one, where we work with sheet two, is a converged solution. Okay? And I'll show you how you do this. So here I have iteration one, so it's going to iterate for me. I put in, the, let's not look at that one, it's kind of boring, but let's look at this one. one times 10 to the minus 4. So this is our first curvature. Last time we took 10 uh, uh, horizontal lines, and here it's just one. So it's just all the same equations as you saw before, as you go across, all the way until well, everything is, until we get uh, to this. You see how summation of forces is exactly zero, right? And what you do is, let's go over here and say, um, this is strain O. So instead of this, this is the converged solution. This is the actual strain, and it's similar to the strain we found. See that? It's 0 0.000771 something. Let's go over here and look at our converged solution to the left. And look, there it is. See? 773. Same. And if you look at the moment, it's approximately the same, you know, 99% the same or whatever, 99%. But what I'm doing is, so let's put in the wrong number here, and then we'll try it. Let's say this is point. Zero, zero, uh, zero, 001. Okay. Now if I go over looking at this line here, this is here, to the forces, total force is minus 194, right? So what you do is you say, okay, I want this, no, that's the wrong one. Uh, apply force here, summation. That's the only one that sticks out like a sore thumb. All the other ones are exactly zero. So this is minus 254. What do we want it to be? Zero. So what we do is we go to, I guess, under data, and you go to a what if analysis and say goal C. And so it says, okay, so it's going to iterate for me. I'm not going to do it the way the long method I was showing. So I say here, set cell B, uh, D10, that's this cell that's highlighted, set it to what value? Zero. Zero. And by changing what? What cell do we want to change? You guys are all pointing that way. <laughs> we want to change um, this, right? And then say OK. That's it. Done. So um, that's a little simple. And so you can, and that's the way I did all of these. And then here, I plotted this is a moment curvature. This isn't uh, as that many elements, uh, that many curvatures, but we do have curvatures from. Quite a few points. See, those are all the points showing. Uh, the, at the beginning, our curvature is a little big. You see how it just takes big step there. It's the same horizontally, but because it's stiff initially, it's, it's doing a big jump, big jump, and then and then these, this is fine. But you could take more curvature steps if you want at the lower point to get more refinement, to get more points here, and you would actually see it cracking if you take more smaller curvature steps. The large curvature steps were initially so that we could see what was happening. In terms of, I didn't take it all the way to. The way you would do this is to determine if this fails, 
because uh, if you look at the strains, and so you actually look at the strains in the 10 slices. Uh, here uh, at the edge of the section, this is uh, positive with compression, 6 times 10 to the minus 3. All of the strains will be smaller than that uh, for the concrete fibers. So this is point, um, zero, zero, 006. What did we say? We had, uh, so we didn't quite get the data, 0.01. So if we went a little further, we get, we finally get where it exceeds 0.01. I mean, one of the fibers would exceed 0.01. And you can see that this fiber is 0.004. This is the extreme fiber at the center. As far as the rebar goes, we're looking at the tension. Let's uh, go look at the strains in the rebar. Um, at, we have 0.03 in tension, 0.03, and we have a capacity of 0.15. So this section will fail when the concrete reaches its ultimate compression strain capacity before the rebar does its tension. So if we went just a few more curvature steps, we'd actually get clear? You like this way better? Or this way? Definitely not that way better. We've got a couple minutes left. Any questions? You yeah. did the, the one in sheet one. Uh, how did you know what to select for values of curvature? What happened was last time we calculated, were you here last class? Yeah. I calculated the ultimate curvature. Okay. And then I divided it by, I think, approximately 100 and said, let's use that as a and the, the, the ultimate curvature wasn't exact as an approximate calculation, but at least it gave me something to, uh, to answer exactly what you said. Okay. Anything else? So what we'll do is the exam will be just on home curvature analysis. I don't think it will be anything on using SAP uh, or uh, the homework that we just did. Uh, I'll post this, and then on Monday we'll go over uh, more details about how you define the ultimate compression strength.